It's an ugly story about ugly people, but that's frequently what the world is. So it's a good time for it, I think. Better than food, man. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Get that coffee. Mm. Today is a book I've been meaning to get to for years. A Feast of Snakes by Harry Cruz. I love the cover on this one. Beautiful looking book. Got some uh, blurbs from Joseph Heller and Norman Mailer on the back, which is appropriate. Published in 1976. Long time coming. Uh, it takes place in the year 1975 in the town of Mystic, Georgia. The author, Dana Kelly, who's a friend, sent this to me as well, the, uh, the other version of it. And uh, so thank you very much, Dana. Really appreciate it. Dana was very kind. He also sent me an autographed copy of uh, The Gospel Singer, which was the first novel by Harry Cruz. Dana is an author in his own right. I've linked to his stuff below. So thank you very much, man. I really appreciate it. Hope you're doing well. Okay, so this is a notorious novel. I think it's uh, been called the best thing that Cruz ever wrote. For those of you who haven't had the pleasure, Harry Cruz has probably one of the most interesting stories of any American author who ever lived. Uh, he grew up in rural Georgia and had what is now kind of a, an, an infamously terrible childhood filled with you know, poverty and violence in a place that just seemed to be stricken with those two things to no end. One memorable moment from his story was uh, when he was a boy uh, or maybe an early teenager, I'm not sure. Uh, he fell into a a vat of boiling water used to scald, you know, slaughtered pigs. The whole first layer of his skin just came right off or something. It's really horrific. So that's the kind of world that Harry Cruz came from. And this is the kind of world that he writes about. What's even more, he'd gotten married to a woman. I think they'd actually gotten married twice. Like they got married once, divorced, and got remarried. They'd had a son and he drowned when he was a kid in the neighbor's pool. Cruz started writing after all that, like seriously. Gritty, vulgar, tough as nails, Southern Gothic fiction. A really, really distinct style and tone. It's great stuff. According to one article in The Independent that I've linked to below, uh, he lived in a manner not dissimilar from the characters that you'd find in his books. That is, you know, kind of as a, as a hellraiser. There's one character who makes recurring appearances in his novels, at least. I've, I've seen him in at least two, I think, named uh, Duffy Dieter. And he's a uh, uh, just kind of a shit-kicking guy who travels around in a Winnebago. It's really weird. <laughs> it was just the time, I guess. But yeah, anyways, I think he's like uh, Cruz's alter ego or something. He appears in this one, too. He doesn't really have much of a role in the plot, but he kind of just shows up and observes. Anyways, eventually Cruz went on to university, became a very successful author, wrote articles for Playboy and Esquire, started teaching at the university himself, hobnobbed with very successful actors, Sean Penn and Madonna were fans of his, Kim Gordon from Sonic Youth and Lydia Lunch started a band called Harry Cruz. He was a big success, so he kind of made it. So it's got kind of a happy ending, especially considering where he came from. And in his older age, he, he, was, a, he was a really interesting guy. He shaved his head into a mohawk. I think he had always felt like an outsider, I think that was his word for it. And so he deliberately made himself one. And uh, he had this tattoo on the side of his arm that was a, a line from a poem by E.E. E. Cummings, a poem called Buffalo Bills. And the line was, how do you like your blue-eyed boy, Mr. Death? And had like a skull on the top there. He was an interesting guy. And Cruz wrote another one called uh, Body which takes place in the world of female competitive bodybuilding in Miami. The culture of bodybuilding is something I'm very interested in at the moment, actually, because of uh, this transformation challenge that I'm currently in for the next maybe approximately 11 weeks or so. It's kind of just like, you know, contest prep. Keep as much muscle on while losing as much fat as possible. A lot of weights, a lot of inclined cardio. So while I'm playing bodybuilder in the challenge, I plan to read this book. Uh, near the end of it to get the full experience, you know? Bodybuilding actually finds its way into, into this one as well in a particularly funny scene when that character that I mentioned, Duffy, uh, Cruz's alter ego, the two football characters from the, from the book, Joe and Willard, and all these men are kind of sniffing each other out and they're all trying to outlift each other uh, <laughs> while drinking whiskey on this portable bench press that Duffy's brought in his Winnebago. There are far better things to consume for a pre-workout. Which reminds me that today's episode is sponsored by Magic Spoon. So these are cereals that are playing off of the sort of like childlike nostalgia, you know, Saturday morning cartoons and that kind of stuff, but healthier and upgraded to 21st century consumers. In this transformation challenge, perhaps the most vital thing, just as important as being in a caloric deficit and keeping up with weight training, is uh, tracking your macros. Hence Magic Spoon. Here, this is your friend. Low calorie, keto friendly, and filled with protein for satiety. Just because the flavor is so good and the protein is so high, that's a difficult winning combination to find 
And I'm sure anybody who's dieted down or like, especially if you're just not doing cheat days and you're just going for it, which is what I'm doing, food is not a pleasurable thing. It, it is no longer a source from which to derive pleasure from. That's not the point any longer. But because the macros are so good, this is kind of an exception. It certainly beats the hell out of having a third serving of 99% lean ground turkey. Man, that stuff is dry. And I imagine it beats rattlesnake too. So while I recommend you read this book, instead of having an actual feast of snakes, why not have a feast of magic spoon? It's high protein, low carb, gluten-free, grain-free, and zero grams of sugar with no artificial flavors or sweeteners. As far as macronutrients go, especially for cereal, you're not gonna do better. 15 grams of carbohydrates, but only five grams of net carbs if you're on keto or low carb or whatever. And even if you're not in contest prep, it's a great choice for a snack and it's way healthier than a lot of breakfast cereals out there. So this, the blueberry, happens to be my favorite. Huh. I just realized that guy has a mustache too, kind of resembles me. And he's in a uh, diving bell riding an octopus. And besides blueberry, they have a variety of flavors, including cocoa, fruity, cinnamon, maple waffle, frosted, and peanut butter. Hmm. And this here's my favorite part. Blueberry on blueberry. Delicious. More. It's really crazy. It does not taste like something that is designed to be healthy, you know? And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed up with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if for any reason you don't like it, you'll get a full refund, no questions asked. Please check them out by clicking on the link below and using the code books are better than food to get $5 off your order today. Or go to magicspoon.com forward slash books are better than food. Hope you enjoy as much as I and thanks a bunch. So this book takes place in Mystic, Georgia during the Rattlesnake Roundup of 1975. The event attracts hunters and weirdos from all over the country. Everything is snake themed. Some people even bring their own snakes. All of it centers around the contest of finding and catching the biggest, longest rattlesnake, and many people eat them. I've heard it tastes kind of like uh, alligator, which I've had, actually. It was okay. Not that great. And this is, and this is real. This is, this is based off of a real event that I think is actually still going on. It's somewhere in Georgia. I forget the name of the town, but I just looked it up. It's crazy. One of the characters who comes to this roundup is uh, one of those snake preachers, you know, that has, it gives, gives sermons with snakes, and he comes to these roundups looking for snakes for his church, for his sermons, I think. Uh, he just quotes from the Bible, and he's like this old man who's really strange with this crazy hair, and you know, it's eerie, you know. Those snake churches in West Virginia or, or Florida, I don't, I don't quite remember where they're from. They might have chapters in both, they're all around. Those are really interesting to read about. That's, that's kind of a trip. This is an acute portrait of grim and biting, podunk, small town failure and despair. Everybody in the story has problems or is causing them or both. Everybody drinks like the world's ending tomorrow and for some of them it just may be. Nihilistic boredom and crushed hope. I mean, dismal. Dismal, but the writing is is like addictive to read. It's so good. It's like so punchy and kind of um, uh, lively, oddly. It's just a circle of people, a group, a culture that has just run out of gas and is doing whatever it can to entertain itself to keep from going insane. It's an ugly story about ugly people, but that's frequently what the world is. So it's a good time for it, I think. I know some of you have, but I'm not sure how many of you have been to small town backwoods Georgia, but even these days, god damn, that is a dark place, man. Frightening. <laughs> I will never forget almost running out of gas out there, headed up to Atlanta once. My god, could not even find a station in the town. Oh my god, Jesus Christ, it was bad. So, you know, as far as the book, it's a, it's a Twin Peaks small town type story where all the drama unfolding between the characters syncs up and connects in the big final disaster that is the story's climax. You know the drill. It's, really, it's like a really dark, gritty 70s film. I mean, I feel like that's like the era for me for books and, uh, and for cinema, for sure. It's like Lord of Dark Places. So growing up in rural Bacon County, Georgia, you know, Cruz grew up uh, in a culture of impoverished, violent, racist characters. And the abysmally despicable characters that uh, compose most of this book share those attributes. You're gonna come across some really racist language. So if you have a hard time with that, don't read it. It's definitely not for everybody. In, in fact, I'd argue it's not for most people. It starts to take on an almost kind of um, horror film quality in the vein of like the Bobby Peru scenes in, in Big Tuna, Texas in Wild at Heart and John Lurie's in that scene too, it's kind of funny. Or The Devil All the Time by Donald Ray Pollock, who must have been inspired by this book. Combined with like some ridiculous macho shit like uh, Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze. I mean, <laughs> it's, you know, it kind of takes on like, it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of weird. It's dark as hell 
but it's also fairly light because it's like a lot of the movie is kind of like a 70s or 80s film. It's like really just like people hanging out and not really like doing anything, you know? So it's like, it was a different time, man. I don't know. People had like time to like, it's a lot of banter. It's also, I thought at one point, kind of like an extremely grim, ostentatious version of uh, The Last Picture Show, uh, which I think is a book, but that, but I've only seen the film and the film is excellent. But there are some similarities, I think. HUD with, uh, with Paul Newman. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, there, there were some similarities with that one too. Paul Newman's always drinking himself to death, isn't he? I was just thinking of The Cat on a Hot Tin Roof with Liz Taylor and him. I just saw that for the first time. That was a good film. That's a good film. Nice dark southern domestic drama. It's dark as hell, but it's also fairly light. That kind of small southern town filled with broken down, never do well, can't help themselves. It's also got a substantial amount of animal abuse insanity, rape, violence. I mean, it's, I mean, take your pick. I mean, it's all there. It's not an easy book to read. It's a good book, but it's uh, unflinching. It's, it's like Lord of Dark Places, which was one of my favorites from last year. I actually think that was a better book, Lord of Dark Places was. Uh, I think uh, Harry Cruz had the better editor. I think, uh, I think uh, Harry Cruz's book was uh, a much better length. Uh, Lord of Dark Places really kind of dragged for a while. But it's like watching a train wreck. It's awful, but you can't turn away. And that, in part, is because the writing is great. Very punchy, dialogue-driven, sometimes laugh-out-loud funny as hell. Dark humor, really dark humor, but sometimes it's just... In particular, I'm thinking um, Shep at the mansion. When the guy hands him the thing and, that, and Shep says what he says, that was... and then the doctor passes out. That was fucking funny. You very well may guffaw all over yourself. I really like listening to Harry Cruz talk because he kind of talks like this. He kind of like talks like a character from King of the Hill. He's like, you deep dirty south. Everything was stories. So here are the main characters. Joe Lon is a local has-been football star who didn't go to college like his high school sweetheart, but instead got married and has two kids before he realizes he is drifting without meaning in an unfulfilled life, selling bootleg whiskey uh, in a shop owned by his uh, dogfight breed pit bull training father, also named Joe. He's referred to as Big Joe. Joe Lon is just Joe Lon. Joe lives in a dumpy trailer with his wife and kids and rents the surrounding land as a campground to the, the hunters and the uh, attendees of this uh, annual rattlesnake roundup. And he's the protagonist, but he's very, very unsympathetic. I mean, he beats his wife to no end, you know, for his own failures because he's, how would you put it? He's failed, he's, he's miserable, but he doesn't quite know why. His sister is insane, his dad is almost as insane, and uh, his mother is dead. We learn why. That's a very interesting story in and of itself. I might spoil that, we'll see. But uh, it's an awful life, and there's no hope whatsoever. Zero hope. That's what the book's about. It's about a man who has no hope. So the story revolves around the, the time that his old flame from high school, Bernice, uh, comes back to town for the Rattlesnake Roundup. So yeah, Joe's father, Big Joe, lives in this old house with Joe's sister, who's gone completely insane, and he methodically, brutally, mercilessly trains pit bulls as fighting dogs, which seemed to be a big deal with the locals. And that is, I mean, he like straps on like weights to them or some shit like that, I think. And he puts them on treadmills and they just, until they fucking, they're falling down. Like it's really grotesque. It's really, the whole story is grotesque, but that's, that's, that's some of the nastiest stuff. I don't know. The animal abuse is pretty, it's all, I mean, it's all bad. That's, that's, maybe that's not the worst, but I mean, it's, it's rough. It's a rough book, but you know, there's like, the, the sick thing is that you know, there's people like this out in the world. And I suppose it's like, kind of like the value of the book is sort of like confronting that reality. And, and Harry Cruz is very good for reality. Harry Cruz is the literary equivalent of like a, a, just a, a solid punch in the face uh, from real life. I mean, really, if, if you want like base real life in the form of a literary punch in the face, you read Harry Cruz, for sure. The antagonist, and I say that in quotes because everybody is unlikable, it's just to what degree, basically, is a repugnant sheriff who preys on women that he locks up in the local jail cell. He has a wooden leg from falling on a punji stick in Vietnam. A punji stick, I learned from Lord of Dark Places, actually, which has a Vietnam War section, is uh, it was, it was a method, it was a weapon created by the Vietnamese that, that is a large spike, uh, you know, that a soldier would fall on, right? It's a large spike that is covered in human shit. So as soon as a soldier, like an American soldier, would fall on the spike, immediately infected, and they'd die. Or 
in this case, have their limbs amputated. Fun, pretty fucked up. He's a pretty grotesque bad guy, you know? One of his rape victims, a girl named Lottie Mae, really remains the sole sympathetic character who we're cheering for after she gets her revenge uh, with a straight razor. You, you can guess and you're probably right. Yeah. The snake hunt is very pagan. It's very um, pagan southern bloodlust. How do you catch a rattlesnake? Well, it's interesting. They go to gopher holes in the early morning, you know, where the snakes are hiding because if they're above ground, you know, snake is cold blood, so it's gonna freeze immediately if it gets to be freezing. So they have to burrow underground into these holes made by gophers to stay warm. So what they do is, you know, all these hunters are going out and they're, they're taking these garden hoses, right? And they, uh, they take these garden hoses, they shove it down these gopher holes as far as they can go, and then they pour a tablespoon of gasoline down the hose. And that sends off these fumes in the hole and the snake gets all disoriented and dizzy and comes up. And then they just, you know, they rope them and pull them out. So that's how they catch them. Doesn't seem very sporting, does it? So yeah, it's a gritty, dirty Southern story about old school masculine rage and failure. It's about feeling trapped like a snake and responding with violence, both men and women. And it's like being an animal beaten down its whole life, up to the point of near death, exhausted, but stubbornly persisting because you don't know what else to do. And while you're strong, very strong even, after enough, there's always that point where enough is enough. And one just says, fuck it, and gives up. And then they kill you just like Tuffy, Big Joe's pit bull. Those two metaphors, the trapped snake and the dog, are very, very, very prominent in the book. It's a book, in a way, about profoundly giving up and letting what will possess you flood your veins like necrotic venom or meth. This is after Joe Lone loses it. He has a mental breakdown after everything happening around him. He just, he just loses it for a moment. And then after it's over, I think the next day or so, he's, he's lying down with his wife to go to sleep. This is what he says. Finally, she said, good night, Joe Lone, honey. Good night, he said. Things will be different tomorrow, she said. All right, he said. Then he had gone carefully to sleep, a deep dreamless sleep, because he knew and accepted for the first time that things would not be different tomorrow, or ever. Things got different for some people, but for some they did not. There were a lot of things you could do, though. One of them was to go nuts trying to pretend things would someday be different. That was one of the things he did not intend to do. It's good, it's good. So better than food? Nah, not quite. Uh, my expectations were high for this one, and you know, I don't know, I feel like I've uh, raised my bar as of late. Uh, I actually like The Lord of Dark Places better, and the books are very similar, in a way. I like Harry Cruz's writing style, and there are some solid portraits of despair, but there's just not a bunch there at the end of the day. Or there could have, I just, I just, there could have been a lot more. I hear others of his are, are really where it's at, actually, so I'm looking forward to them. The subplot of the father and his pit bulls actually reminded me of um, Nick Cave's And the Ass Saw the Angel, which I, I would have a hard time believing Cave actually didn't read uh, A Feast of Snakes uh, before writing that one. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised at all if he was inspired by that. It's all right, but there's just not, there's just not a lot there. So you should read it. Well, if you like, uh, I mean, the usual suspects, I think, for Southern Gothic literature, I mean, Cormac McCarthy, uh, Flannery O'Connor, yeah, and Nick Cave. Uh, well, I'd say definitely if you were a fan of Hal Bennett's Lord of Dark Places, the, book, the books have a, have a striking amount of similarity. They're similar writers in their style, but overall I thought Lord of Dark Places was the better book. So what did I dislike? Well, a lot of Cruz's writing is just like, it's just banter. Like people shooting the shit or hanging out or like, you know, when it's working, it's funny, but you know, it's just not, uh, there's a lot of filler. Some of it was laugh out loud funny. Other parts were just kind of cringe or stale. It's got a lot of great bad vibe moments like Twin Peaks, but you know, overall, I just think he was capable of more. I might have said a couple years back that Devil All the Time was better than food, but I've since changed my mind if that was the case. A Feast of Snakes was better than Devil All the Time, but neither was jaw dropping. Both are good, but not great. In my experience so far, I mean like creme de la creme of Southern Gothic would be Cormac McCarthy and Faulkner. That's the best you're gonna do. And Lord of Dark Places was better than this one. I think you got a good idea. All right. <sighs> Coffee time. For those of you who are new, thank you very much for stopping by and watching. I take all the names of the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video to the show. I place their names in this mason jar. And for every review I do, I pull out a name and whoever's name I pull out is sent a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing, plus a bag of coffee roasted by yours truly. And the coffee is delicious. And if you'd like to get in on that, you can click on the link below and donate $5 or more per video to the show. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, international shipping is not included. Sorry about that.
For one dollar more, you get all these reviews ad free, plus access to the patron only reviews, the Discord channel, and the Better Than Friday newsletter that I send out every Friday, which is just a list of five different things I'm interested in at any given time. Could be books in the pipeline, music, film, changes week to week. If you'd like to learn more and support the show, you can click on the link below and donate five dollars or more per video on Patreon. And I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the patrons, and best of luck. Diskoyevsky. Thank you very much, Diskoyevsky. You're going to receive a Feast of Snakes by Harry Cruz, plus a bag of coffee roasted by yours truly. And I hope you love both. Thank you so much. Well, that's all I've got for you today. Please subscribe if you have not already and hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this. And always remember, bring a book wherever you go, especially to the rural deep south. But if you're going there, boy, I wish you luck. <laughs> all right. Take care of yourselves. Have a great night. Talk to you soon. Ciao.